Uh, so hi, I'm, uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about place names. So place names are, is a fairly varied subject, but my specific work has been on uh, mine names. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about mine names in the, the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Glasgow. So Glasgow is a place that we're all familiar with, but it's not necessarily a word that we give a lot of thought to. For us, uh, knowing the meaning of a word is not necessarily necessary it's not necessary to understand uh, its own uh, the thing it refers to glasgow uh, for example is a fairly a fairly uh, typical example of a place name that simply describes the place that it's labeling uh, glasgow is actually named for the depression in the landscape that exists uh, between the cathedral and the necropolis in the east end of the city and it translates as uh, green hollow as you can see there so this essentially amounts to verbal gesturing. Uh, when I say, I'm here or you're there, uh, I'm, signaling to, uh, I'm using words to signal where I am, the same way that someone finding their way by the landscape would do uh, with a, a place name. What we're essentially saying is, when you reach the Green Hollow, you've arrived in Glasgow. In linguistics, we call this concept deexis. Now, deexis is fairly common in place naming, uh, as settlers of the past would use the landscape for navigation, as I mentioned before, and place names would act almost as a precursor to traditional maps in many senses. Uh, but the landscape can only really tell us so much, and that brings us to the question, well, what if we can't see what we're verbally pointing at? Which takes us to the Forest of Dean. Now, the Forest of Dean is one of the last ancient woodlands in the UK, and it's situated in the county of Gloucestershire in the southwest of, the, uh, of England. The area has a long history of mining iron and ochre, which is a nice tie into the, the talk previous. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about the coal mines that were really the powerhouse of the local economy in the Industrial Revolution. But you might be thinking, well, why the Forest of Dean? Well, the, uh, the area has a very minor coal field in the grand scheme of things in the UK, uh, but it hosts a really rich and unique culture around mining that makes it especially interesting to study. Uh, the area is largely self-governing by way of a, ro a royal charter that was granted to the miners of the Forest of Dean thanks to their efforts in aiding uh, Edward II's attempts to take and retake Berwick-upon-Tweed in the late 13th and early 14th centuries. So that, um, that royal charter granted the right to mine within an area known as the Hundred of St. Brevels, which is what you can see here. Uh, that right was given exclusively to men who were born in that area who had come to be known as the Forest of Dean Free Miners. That right was then encoded in an Act of Parliament in 1838, which set out the qualifications that were necessary for someone to register as a free miner. So to signal the significance of the mining industry to this area, I think it's important to talk about some numbers, because some people in the area often say that there was a time when more people worked below ground in the forest than worked above it. And that might not be too far from the truth. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, at least 50% of the, the, working the working male population in the area worked underground in mines in the Forest of Dean. And that's to say nothing of the women and children who were likely to have been involved in the industry as well. And the industry is actually still going. So despite the fact that the last, mine in the for the last major mine in the Forest of Dean closed in 1965, uh, there are still 150 registered free miners in the area and a handful of mines are actually still operating, at least on a part-time basis. There's also been some modest progress in modernizing the law, with the first female free miner being uh, registered in 2010 there, after the original law uh, granted the right only to uh, male miners in the area. All of this is essentially to say that despite the massive decline in coal as a, a usable energy source, the mining industry still holds a lot of local importance beyond just simple post-industrial tourism. While it's not a matter of putting food on the table for most people anymore, uh, I think it's not unfair to say that the success of the Forest of Dean is almost inextricably linked to the success of its mining industry. And that brings us back to names. Now, my survey uh, looked to record uh, mine names in the Forest of Dean that began being recorded around about the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And they, they kept being recorded throughout that period up until the beginning of the First World War. This resulted in a collection of over 400 names, 
uh, which mostly came from archive maps, like, what you, like the one you can see here, uh, but also came from some registry documents and also uh, interviews with local industry professionals, which were really helpful in uh, providing some context on the names that I, was, uh, that I was researching. Now, the first type of name I'm going to talk about is something close to the settlement names we were talking about earlier. Elwood Colliery, for example, works in almost an identical way to Glasgow, essentially saying, when you arrive at the colliery, colliery in the village of Elwood, you've arrived at Elwood Colliery. Uh, there are also some more metaphoric examples of names. For example, four brothers, three brothers, and two brothers there uh, are all examples which point to landmarks. In this case, uh, a series of oak trees that sit at the entrance to those particular mines. But again, what do, we, uh, what do we do when you're naming something that we can't actually see? Uh, for a miner, this is vitally important in some cases because names can convey information as to the profitability of a mine, but also to the working condition and safety that would be found from working in there. And that all of this can be done with a name without picking up a shovel. And this is another sort of name that I found in my data. So in terms of uh, some uh, visual examples there, Names like Hopewell, Winning, and Success all relay information as to the economic success, the economic reward, sorry, that can be found from working in those particular mines. And those three certainly don't make up a definitive list. There are many more here which highlight the, the, the economic winnings that can come from working in those particular mines uh, that we, we have named here. So some of my favorites here are uh, elements like Alexandria Colliery, which is named for the, the great city. Um, Never Fail Colliery, and Spiro, which was Italian for hope. So that was quite nice to find in the data as a little bit of a curveball. Um, I think the number of names that we find here uh, is indicative that uh, this is certainly more of a local trend than it is just one person's superstition. Um, but what's not entirely clear is whether these names are given before a mine opens or after it had already been running. So what we can tell from these is whether a mine is, uh, a mine is being named in order to entice workers or if a, uh, a mine is kind of boasting about success. There are some names, though, that we can tell have been named retrospectively in all likelihood, and mostly because these come with more kind of dire connotations. So in contrast to the, uh, the ones on the previous side, uh, names like Tormentor, Farmer's Folly, and Uncertainty all represent mines that are likely to have been uh, less successful endeavors in, uh, in at least their economy. Uh, these are obviously more unfortunate names that are given for their lack of prosperity. And again, these ones aren't quite the, the entire list. And so while there are definitely fewer negative names in, the, in this, uh, this category, there are still enough that we can say that this is a bit of a local trend and not just one man's losing streak other than poor George there. Uh, so interestingly, uh, these also don't just point to the lack of... Uh, the lack of economic success that uh, the, mines of, the mines have experienced, but also to the potential of physical danger, especially in uh, the case of names like Tormentor and Holt. Uh, so then what we can say from these names is that the, the name of a mine isn't just linked to the success of the mining industry in the forest, but is also linked to the success and ultimate safety of the Forest of Dean's miners. Uh, so where do we go with this research from here? Well, uh, as I said before, the Forest of Dean is a relatively minor coal field in the UK, and it sits in a really rural area, and the idiosyncrasies that come along with the free mining tradition mean that, uh, realistically, the, the results of this study can't really be extrapolated to say anything about uh, the rest of the country. In saying that, though, this is the first study that looks at names in the mining industry, which is strange given the importance of mining not just to... Uh, people in the last 200 years, but also, as I mentioned, to people across the last two millennia in this country. It's my intention, then, to take this study a bit further and expand into larger coal fields with some la with larger, uh, with larger coal, expand into larger coal, coal fields with more miners that might be naming, and also some larger colliery companies that could be dictating naming policy. And as I think I've highlighted in this slide, I'm not running out of data anytime soon. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>